Hey everybody at Homewood Old Guy Hi-Fi Channel. Hope everyone's doing well today. Well, we've got the Galleon TS120SE tube integrated amplifier from our good friend Thomas Tan of Thomas and Stereo fame. It's a pretty amazing piece. So sit back, relax, and we're going to talk about this wonderful integrated amp. Old Guy Hi-Fi talking true. Stereo dreams he shares with you. So the Galleon TS120SE is a really interesting, well thought out tube integrated amplifier. Really well thought out. It's unique in that you can run it in class A mode or class A B mode. Now if you run it in class A, you're going to get 30 watts a channel um, and you're going to get a frequency response of 12 hertz to 80,000 hertz. In class A B mode, you're going to get 50 watts a channel and a frequency response of 17 hertz to 65,000 hertz. Now the standard complemented tubes are KT88, 12AT7, 12AX7, but if you want to on power tubes, you can put in 6550s or KT120s if you want to. I did use two sets of tubes with this amplifier. I used the stock PS Vane tubes, which came come with it from the factory, and PS Vane was kind enough to send me a set of their new Horizon series of tubes, and I did use those. And again, full complement, KT88s, 12AT7s, and 12AX7s. Um, the nice thing about this is if you do roll tubes, it's got an auto bias feature, which is really, really nice and very simple to use. And as a matter of fact, if you want to, you can change mode between class A and class AB or bias your tubes right from your easy chair with the remote control, as well as accessing all your inputs and everything else. The only one you don't have any uh, remote control over is the tone uh, or the color sound setting. And I'll talk about that in just a second. So IR button, power. I'm not going to power it on. Tube amplifiers don't like to be powered on when there's no load connected to the speaker outputs, the terminal outputs. So I don't want to. This is a change button. When you push this, what it does is either sets it up so you can change from class a to class a b mode or you're going to bias your tubes when you push it these four leds will light up blue if you push the bias button it'll go through and there's a microprocessor that actually looks at all the tubes sets their bias voltage and when they'll flash red and blue and when they all turn solid blue you come back and hit the change button boom your tubes are biased same with class a b once you've done and all the tubes are the lights are blue hit change and you're in class a mode or class a book B mode, whichever one you chose. Really nice high quality Alps volume pot. Uh, it is a motorized volume control. Tone controls are really interesting. Most, and I don't know the exact frequencies, and if I can find out from Thomas, I'll put them here. On most equipment, the, the treble control center frequency is 10 kilohertz, which is way up high. It's kind of not really useful, just kind of adds energy, but not any clarity. I tried these and I don't know the frequencies, but they were very useful frequencies and it had a very nice effect without it being kind of changing things or adding energy to the sound. It was very useful, but 99.9% of the time I did not use the tone controls. And that's where the sound control comes in. In the T setting, tone controls are active. In the A setting, Thomas said, there's more negative feedback applied to the amplifier and you'll get 5% additional transparency. That's a small number. I don't know that I heard it. In class B mode, there was less negative feedback. I found myself preferring class, not class B, tone B setting more than I prefer the tone A setting. I just thought there was a little more drive to it, a little more, I thought actually a little better imaging and so forth. And we'll talk about that. And then of course your input control. Now, it's too heavy. It weighs 65 pounds. I'm not going to spin this thing around, but I will show you a picture of it and we'll talk about it going from your right to your left. IEC power socket, master power switch. Next to that is a ground lift switch, which is really interesting because if you do get ground and, and with the transformer outputs on tube amplifiers, sometimes they can be susceptible to that. This can help ameliorate that. Your speaker terminals class, uh, excuse me, uh, four ohm and eight ohm taps and <laughs> the ground. Next to that is the subwoofer output. Next to that is the fixed line level output. Next to that is the home theater bypass and then four line level inputs. And again, everything is accessible from the remote control, which weighs a ton. If you bonk somebody in the head, you give them a concussion with this thing. Really, really nice. This thing is extraordinarily well constructed. Now, what's the difference between a TS120 and a TS120 SE? Well, according to Thomas, the 120 uh, has a slightly warmer sound and a little bit punchier bass, so a little bit more of a V curve. He said on the special edition version, he voiced it differently, and I know he spent months voicing these amplifiers, both the standard edition and the uh, 
the uh, special edition. The SE has a slightly more neutral presentation with a slightly more nuanced bass response, and bass response was excellent. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, also, in the standard edition, they use uh, Solon capacitors and clarity caps, but in the special edition, they double the value of those cap caps, and they use Jupiter caps, Japanese Jupiter caps, and then the top-of-the-line clarity caps. And I don't know the difference between the two. I just know they sounded really, really good. So the special edition, he said he's voiced it for those people those who like a smoother mid-range and a more balanced presentation, and this does do that. So how did I test it? I've had it since the beginning of September, and when I first got it in, I, uh, PS Vane was kind enough to send me a, a set of their brand new Horizon tubes, um, and now the uh, stock tubes followed the amp later, a couple weeks later. So my initial listening sessions were with the Horizon tubes, and then when the standard edition came in, I listened to it that way. So it was about 50% on the Horizon tube, 50% on the standard tube. I fed it, I streamed from Audivana feeding uh, the live Harmony DAC going into this on single-ended because there's no balance on it. I did feed it from my shit Bifrost, my modified Bifrost. I did feed it from the Giselli Daisy with the upgraded Sparkos op amps. I did feed it from the Denifrips Pontus 12th that I did a review on recently. Um, I did feed it from my J2S. Um, and I did feed it analog using my turntable with both my uh, moving magnet ATVM 540 ML cartridge and my new ATOC9EXN, I think that's the model number, moving coil cartridge with a Cambridge Alva Duo doing phono preamp duties for both. So really, really interesting. So. I tested it with the my big wharf tails. I tested it with the Elax. I tested it with the Triangle Duetto Magellan Duetto 40th that I had here. Um, I did use the uh, Dolly Opticons, which you just saw a review of, um, and I used the Neil Blanchard MLTL6 stand mount transmission line speakers. About 50% of the time on the big wharf tails, and about 50% of the time on the big or on the Neil Blanchard speakers. I did not use my subwoofer because I wanted to get a good idea of the bass response on this. And as we know, most of the time you suspect or you would assume solid state or class D is going to have a better bass. And honestly, they probably do just a bit. This thing does really well on bass. And I know Thomas said it's got a little bit of a V-shaped. The SE is a little flatter of a curve than the standard edition, um, but really, really interesting. And the other nice thing about this was no matter what speaker I put it on, no matter how long I listened to it, no matter what source I fed it, zero fatigue. It never got fatiguing. It just encouraged me to go play with it longer. Just come and play with me. It's really, really interesting. And I know he spent months trying to voice this thing, and he wanted to make sure it was just a best balance between the right amount of detail and the right amount of you know definition in the higher frequencies um, and all of the amp and the, the final design both the standard edition and the special edition he tuned by ear and he's got a pretty good ear i think really really nice so before i talk about sound um, normally i would be going and telling you i was going to open this thing up it's too heavy i don't want to risk it i'm not going to mess with it done if I can get a picture, I'll show you. Um, but I listened to a lot of stuff. I had it since the beginning of September, as I mentioned. Um, and I went down the rabbit hole with this thing for hours and hours and days and days and just a really long time But and with both sets of tubes. Um, and so a lot of the ambient stuff I listened to, it did a really good job, really good bass, very good drive in the bass. And we'll talk about the differences in just a second. But some standout recordings for me and where this thing... I think can really, really shine. This recording from the Oscar Peterson trio called We Get Requests. This is from 1964. This is generally regarded as one of the best uh, jazz albums. Just absolute excellent recording, uh, pristine sound quality, amazing performances on all the tracks. Just wonderful. And this was recorded at RCA Victor Studios in New York City in 1964. Um, and I think it was in October of 64. Um, and it's just amazing. You've got, obviously, Oscar Peterson on piano. You've got the famous, the amazing Ray Brown on bass and Ed Thigpen on drums. Just a wonderful combination. Um, Oscar Peterson is one of the most amazing pianists I've ever seen. I know he can play jazz. I know he could play honky tonk. I know he could play classical. His dexterity on the keyboard, and you'll hear it on tracks like my uh, one and only love, 
I mean, I don't know how his fingers can move as fast as they sound like they're moving. Just amazing. They'd be all like this if it was me doing it, right? Um, it just amazing and good sound quality. Now, it is a early 60s, mid 60s recording. So there is a little bit of stridency in it. And it's a recording because I've heard it on other systems having that same kind of edge. Once you kind of get up the right hand of the piano, just a little bit, but it is still an amazing performance. Now, uh, Ray Brown's bass line, he is just amazing. If you listen to the track, Have You Met Miss Brown, or Miss Jones, excuse me, Ray Brown's bass on that is just so beautiful to listen to. It's just all the texture. You can hear his fingers on the strings. You can just, you can hear his, you know, hand, his fingers running up and down the neck and the body of the bass. It just really, really well recorded in some amazing performances. And then on tracks like, um, uh, uh, D and E, you can hear Ed Thigpen's drums, just amazing. His drum and his brush, just the tone and the and the touch and the chops that he has is just amazing. Um, this is and, and, and on the song D and E, you can actually hear, and I believe it is, because the only mic that would be close to close to someone's mouth would be on Oscar Peterson's uh, the piano mic. Is you can hear him kind of scatting under his breath. It's really faint, but it's there. And this pulled it out really beautifully. Just it was such a great album. Honestly, if you're not if you're not familiar with the Oscar Peterson trio. This is a great place to start, and it'll just encourage you to dig deeper. Now, for some classical music, I use this recording from Kevin Mallow and the Toronto Chamber Orchestra. This is Haydn's Symphonies 62, 107, and 108, and the uh, La Vera Costanza Overture and the La Speciale Overture. And this is from 2008, and this was recorded in late June of 2008 at um, St. Anne's Church in Toronto. So not a traditional concert hall, but this is part of a series, 34 CDs, I think, of Naxos doing all of the Haydn symphonies, because there are 108 symphonies. And they recorded them all, uh, Kevin Mallon in the Toronto Chamber. And it, this is the last one in the series. It's beautifully done. It is just amazing. Now, Symphony Number no. 62 is relatively unknown because it kind of falls in the middle of literally 108 different symphonies. And it is. It was composed in 1780, in 1780 while um, Haydn was under the uh, sponsorship of the Esterhazy House. And Esterhazy's were a Hungarian uh, royal family. Uh, They're very prominent in the Holy Roman Empire. Um, and so he, they were his patrons. And so he performed, uh, he wrote a lot of the music for them. And in this period, in this mid period of the symphonies, he's also doing a lot of theatrical stuff because, you know, just listening to music isn't enough. They want to see stuff on stage. And these are being performed at these big events that these very noble families have where they invite everybody in. And it's really kind of interesting. Now, the later symphonies, uh, 107 and 108, are actually recorded before in the 1750s. They're originally known as Symphony A and B, but they weren't lost into the catalog of symphonies until later. So they're very early on. Um, and they're both, both those symphonies are scored for pairs of oboes, pairs of horns, strings, and harpsichord. So there's a lot of really good, very uh, intricate mid-range detail in this recording. And it really, really good. So it is super well recorded. The, again, being recorded in a church, most the interior, most churches are masonry, hard surfaces, things like that. So you get a really good sense of room, and we'll talk about imaging and all that other stuff. But on this recording, it's got a great sense of room. Now, it doesn't have necessarily the standard orchestral seating chart, you know, that fan-shaped seating chart. Um, and I think also, too, it's mic'd a little bit different than the conventional concert hall. But, oh, my goodness, does it sound wonderful. Um, the strings are just the individual strings you can pull out. They're just so well recorded. You can, even in the masterings, nothing gets confused, nothing gets congested, nothing gets, you know, there's not so much energy that it starts to ring like you can sometimes get, um, especially in a very, you know, uh, live uh, space like a church or a really hard walled, you know, recording studio. Um, just really rewarding. And again, you can pick out individual instruments. It is the, the interesting thing about this, and I think the Toronto Chamber and just under Malin's, Kevin Malin's, um, uh, baton, it is just, it's very delicate and there's a great sense of sound, very lush, very deep, very three dimensional, but not laser focused. And I don't think, and I, that's fine with me. A lot of, I think the imaging quality of any recording 
or anything you listen to is based on the quality of the recording. And this is a very high quality recording. And the center image is on all these, on the, all the albums I'm gonna talk about, it's very laser focused. But once you get past that, you know about where everybody is. And of course the studio albums, it's all manufactured by the engineers. But in this particular recording, again, not a standard uh, orchestral seating chart, you get a good sense of who's further away from the mics or who's closer, left, right, but maybe not laser pinpoint. And I'm okay with that. I, and again, it can be recording dependent. So really beautiful on this. So the next one I want to talk about is this album from Heinrich Frischlader, and it's called Recorded by Martin Meinschaffer II, and it's from 2008, and Heinrich Frischlader is an amazing German blues musician. You'd swear he was from Mississippi. He's got this amazing gravel voice. He's got this amazing guitar tone and touch. Um, he's played with Joe, Mata, Joe Bonamassa, B.B. King, uh, Peter Green. I mean, this guy is famous in Europe. Not so famous here. Maybe some of you have heard of him, but just wonderful. And it is just good blues. Now, he plays every instrument on this recording except the Hammond organ. So there's really no imaging, and there's no sense that all the musicians were in the same room at the same time, because obviously they weren't. But a great recording, great touch, great blues, great voice, just really good rhythm, some good rock riffs in it, really good electric bass, really good, good studio recording, and very rewarding to listen to. Highly recommended if you're a blues fan. You gotta check this one out. Just great, great energy, great drive, um, real good, like I said, real good mix of, of blues and straight ahead rock and roll. Very, very good. Sorry about that, the battery died on the camera. Anyway, um, so that Henrik Frischleiter, very highly recommended, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So how does this thing sound overall? Um, again, I think it does have a little bit of a, a V-shaped curve, a little bit of extra energy in the bass. Um, and I, with the stock PS vein tubes, really good bass, especially when on like Ray Brown's bass on the Oscar Peterson Trio album, really good, really textured, really nuanced. I didn't, for what I'm talking about here, I didn't go super bass, a super deep bass. And I never used the subwoofer because I just wanted to use this. Now, the nice thing is the Neil Blanchard MLTL 6s I think they're tuned to like, 30 hertz or 32 hertz and they'll dig deep really good on their own um, so i just listened to it a la natural um, but i did listen to some of my crazy electronic stuff when i was just doing it for fun and just kind of you know just playing around with it a little bit and this thing will dig deep as deep as a big powerful solid state or class solid state class a b or class d amplifier probably not but it's really rewarding it's very smooth very nuanced and again a lot of the stuff i used to, for this i'm talking about our acoustic bass um, there is electric bass obviously in the henrik Trischleiter uh, recording but really good good pace to it, good good speed to the bass. So it never felt like anything was lagging behind. Um, sometimes on low power tube amps or, um, you know, not really well designed, and this is really well designed, not really well designed tube amplifiers, you get a, you can get a sense of a little bit of a slowness. There's kind of almost a little bit of a plodding sense to it. This is not, this was agile and it was good and quick. And I think, <clears throat> especially on Ray Brown's acoustic bass, I think, there was an awful lot of detail revealed on that, and it sounded just supernatural. It just sounded like you would expect it to sound. Uh, very, very good on that. As far as moving up into the, uh, into the um, upper, mid, lower mid, ba mid range, upper mid bass, lower mid range, where Henrik Frischleiter's voice lives in that area, really good, really textured, really nuanced. His voice is, he's got an amazing voice. You'd swear he grew up in Mississippi and not Germany. Um, good texture, good kind of a gravelly sound to it, good nuance. Um, great, you can hear all of the, the nuance in the electric guitar. You can kind of hear his fingers on the, on the fretboard. Um, just a really, really good presentation. Now, on the, on the standard stock tubes, excellent presentation, very good. Voice was very, very good. On the PS Vane Horizon tubes, I thought that there might be just a smidge more detail in, the, in that mid-range area where his voice lived and in where electric guitar lived and um, the piano, some of it, and the, kind of the upper registers of the acoustic bass, just a little bit more detail. Not, not that the standard PS Vane tubes lacked detail, I just thought there was a little more micro dynamic, a little more micro detail with the horizon tubes. As we move up into the mid-range, the stock tubes, very smooth, very detailed, very, very excellent. I mean, strings sounded wonderful. Um, on the Haydn symphonies. Um, again, everything was just in its proper place with its proper amount of energy and pace and so forth. Now, that was with the stock tubes. With the Horizon tubes, I thought there was a little bit more detail, a little bit more uh, information on the leading edge of notes, just a little bit more drive to it. 
neither set of tubes created any listening fatigue at all. N neither set of tubes were strident or, or scratchy or anything. The stock tube's a little warmer than the Horizon, but the Horizon may be a little more detailed. And as you move up through the mid-range into the upper mid-range, lower treble re region, again, a very similar characteristic, stock tubes, very smooth and nice and detailed. The Horizon tubes may be a little extra detail, a little more microdynamics. Um, transients were a little bit better reproduced. The decay was a little bit longer and a little bit better. When you got up into the upper treble, however, the stock tubes remain that smooth character and the Horizon tubes, depending on the recording and the instrument, sometimes got just a little bit of I don't know, extra energy, maybe not extra detail, but a little extra energy wasn't fatiguing, wasn't annoying, wasn't bad. I mean, transients on both sets of tubes were really well produced. I thought the decays on the horizon tubes extended just a little bit longer. And I'm these are very subtle differences uh, extended just a little bit longer than the stock tubes. Excellent. Now, both sets of tubes imaging was very, very similar. Very good center image. Now, Imaging is so much of it depends on the rest of the chain. So I'm feeding it from Artivana through a live harmony. Very, very good deck. Um, this does a great job of taking that really good signal and getting it out to your speakers. But a lot of the uh, nuance and subtlety and so forth uh, that in imaging is very much recording dependent. So the Oscar Peterson Trio and the Heinrich Frischleiter albums, they're both studio albums. So whatever imaging is there is manufactured. And of course, being a mid 60s recording, the Oscar Peterson Trio one is you got Ray's ba Ray Brown's bass on one side and Ed Thigpen's drum on the other and Oscar in the middle. And his piano sounds like it's about 20 feet wide. Um, and that's just the way it is. Doesn't mean it's not a recording, li a rewarding listen. It very much is. And that's the thing we have to keep in mind about all of this is there's no best, there's no standard. It is whatever you enjoy. And you can enjoy great recording on very modest equipment, um, or you can enjoy a very modest recording on great equipment. It doesn't really matter. This did an exemplary job. Of all of the amplifiers I've heard, um, this would rank in probably somewhere in the top 10. Um, and again, there is no best, just so you know that there is no best. They're all different, they all have strengths and weaknesses. From tube amplifiers, I would say this probably, again, I would rank this probably in the top five tube amplifiers I've heard. Um, and I've heard some really good stuff in the past. This is very well done at $44.95. It's not inexpensive, but this could be your end game amplifier. And again, when you can roll tubes, and I heard differences between the stock PS vein tubes and the horizon tubes. When you can roll tubes and change the sound, I'm sure if you got a set of, you know, uh, NOS, Gold Lion, KT88s, you know, for 400 bucks a piece, you can make this thing just absolute magic. It was magic with the stock tubes. It was magic with the horizon tubes. Very, very good. Um, great overall sound quality, no fatigue. I could listen to it for hours. It was a very, very faithful companion for me in all of the hours I listened to it. Just really, really enjoyed it a great deal. Now, these are unique in that Thomas has voiced all of these by his own personal ears. I mean, it's not just a formula, um, not each individual amp, but the overall sound quality was determined by him. And it's very high quality manufacturing, um, very, very nicely put together, really a, a very rewarding, and I think well worth it for the price of admission. Beautifully executed, convenient remote control, lots of great stuff. It weighs too much, but other than that, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed my time with it. And hopefully you enjoyed the video and you'd be willing to give me a like and a subscribe. And if you wish to, there is a thank you button at the bottom of the video window if you want to support the channel. You can also join the channel. There'll be a membership link in the pinned comment and in the video description. There will be a link to Thomas's website. I have no affiliation with him. He does sell direct. Um, so you can reach out, find out from him there. Um, there are also affiliate links, Amazon affiliate links in the video description. You know the drill, my playlist. Please comment. Let me know. Are you curious about tubes. You're looking at tubes. Um, I've had a couple of interesting ones. I've had that little low power tube amplifier I just did the review on, which was really interesting. And I've had another tube hybrid amplifier in, and I don't know if you've seen that review yet, but um, you will. And it's a tube, tube front end, uh, solid state back end. It doesn't hold a candle to this. This is really, again, one of the top 10 amplifiers I think I've ever heard. Very, very good. Very well done and beautiful. So comment. Let me know your thoughts about tubes. Let me know your thoughts about the video. Let me know your thoughts about the music I, I recommend. Um, I think I've done enough and said enough and I've babbled for way too long. This was a long review. This took a long time to get done. Um, I wanted to make sure I had it right. And I think I did. I think I got it right. Anyway, my name's Ed Homewood. This is the Old Guy Hi-Fi channel. And now I'm ordering you. I'm giving you your marching orders. 
grab some music you love, put it on a wonderful amplifier, sit back in your chair and just relax and listen to it for the balance of your day and let your blood pressure come down and your heart rate slow down and just enjoy life. Thank you so very much for your time. I'm grateful for it. Feel the rhythms break through music's heartbeat soft.